Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come before you and, Lord, to just lift your name up. Father, you said in your word, if I be lifted up, I would draw all men to myself. And now, Lord, we know and understand that that teaches about the type of death that you were to die, but also in principle that as you're lifted up in our midst, you're going to draw people to yourself because that's what it's about. It's not about drawing people to this church for the sake of whatever except that we lift Jesus, our Messiah, up before the world, before the, every, everyone that we come in contact with. And so, Lord, I pray, Father, that you would have your way in our midst. May your anointing be rich. May folks who are uh, forced to stay home due to COVID, I pray, Lord, that they would be just as enjoying your presence at their house, worshiping you, uh, receiving from your word as if they were here. And, Lord, about COVID, Father, I just lift up. You know the situations around our country, around the globe. And I ask you, Father, for a complete healing. I pray, God, that you would just kick this thing out of the world. Uh, and God, bring healing to those that may have been affected by COVID. Thank you for your protection on those from our church who have uh, not had COVID. Uh, and I'm so grateful, Lord Jesus, for that, for your protective hand. And then, God, I pray, Lord, for our leadership, our government. Lord God, that, uh, Lord, they would take a place of science and medical and not dictatorship. And so, Lord God, I pray, Father, for your wisdom upon our governors, both Sununu and, and Governor Scott here in New Hampshire and Vermont, because we have both that visit and call this their home place of worship. And so, God, I just thank you and I praise you. We give you all the worship, we give you all the worship that's due your name, in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Dan, would you care to share? Okay, I'd like to share from Isaiah 8. Um, this is a time in Israel's history when um, the prophet Isaiah was saying things that were not politically correct. He was bucking the system big time. And because of that, he got into a lot of trouble. Hmm. And in the midst of all of that, he has these words in verse 12. Do not call conspiracy everything that these people call conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear. Do not dread it. The Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread, and he will be a sanctuary. Amen. And I, I, it's just crazy in the world right now and in America with COVID and politics and election stuff. Um, and there are many who are politically correct who will say things that Christians and conservatives are doing are conspiratorial that they're resembling insurrection, that they're, they're going against uh, the wisdom of the elite, the, the wisdom of the scientific community. Unfortunately, there is a lot of the scientific community that is politically correct and not scientifically correct, in my opinion. And so those who will stand up and take a st stand for science for evidence, for research, for all of that will get shouted down, especially if it counters the politically correct message of the left and whoever else. But what God wants us to do in the middle of all this is not to call conspiracy what others call conspiracy, but to see that we are acting in faith. Yes, we ought not to be foolish. Mm. We ought not to uh, see how close we can get to people and how many germs we can get before we get sick. No, no, no. We need to be wise. We need to be shrewd, mm. but innocent. Mm -hmm. And I think in the midst of that, if we will not give way to fear mm. and panic and depression, because God is in charge Amen. and he is with us Amen. and he will watch over us. Mm. And he will take care of us. He will be a sanctuary for us. Amen. Because we act in faith, mm. not foolishness. Mm. So I'm saying, you know, mask wearing where it's appropriate and uh, hand washing and the distancing and everything. But we cannot give way to the spirit of fear that is controlling whole cities and states Amen. right now. Amen. And we can't give way to the tyranny of puppets who found they have a great excuse 
to control and manipulate and dominate. We can't give way to them. We have to find godly ways to resist in prayer and in fasting and in acting in faith. That's what I wanted to say. Um, we have a different way of relating to all this craziness than the world, and we need to start doing it that way. God bless everybody. Amen. Amen. I'll tell you, I don't know how people do it without Jesus. I really don't. Because I need Jesus every single day of every single week of every single month and year, etc. Amen. Amen? Amen. You're welcome to stand with us and join. And guess what? We're going to start singing some Christmas stuff. Yeah! <laughs>
could not hold you, the veil tore before you, silence the boast of sin and fame. Heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory, for you are raised to life again. You have no to transform some of you the way you think about why certain things were written in the New Testament as they are because 2,000 years later a different language different culture sometimes we can miss things and so like I said we're going to try to cover 400 years in a short period of time amen let's pray Heavenly Father I'm asking you for your help I don't want to say what you don't want me to say I want to say what you want me to say Help me with clarity to bring perspective to an understanding, a deeper understanding of your word, of the culture, of your people, the time in which they were living in when Jesus came and hit the scene as the newborn baby. So Lord God, I just praise you and I thank you for this time. I thank you for your word. I thank you for all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we're going to be talking about 400 silent years. So in the, in the Old Testament, there are six books that are noted to be the last books written prior to the New Testament writings. They're First and Second Chronicles, and those were done between 450 and 400 B.C., before Christ. Ezra and Nehemiah, sometime in the 400s. Esther, sometime in the 400s. And Malachi, sometime in the 400s. So if you were looking for exact dates, sorry, don't have them. Historians still argue about exact dates dates but that's okay we're not going to argue today amen all right so now think about this when you look at your bible the way it's designed you have the first five books which are the pentateuch right so after you get out of uh deuteronomy then you go into joshua 
And Joshua talks about how they come into the new promised land. And then you go into Judges, and you see an up and down for hundreds of years of leadership and moral depravity and moral ecstasy and, you know, tight with God and away from God and tight with God and away from God, depression and uh, overcome by their captors and then release, God brings release. And so then after that, then you get into um, Samuel, First and Second Samuel. I know I'm skipping a little bit. First and Second Samuel, which talks about the kings uh, are birthed in First and Second Samuel. And so then you go into First and Second Kings, and then First and Second Chronicles, which are in that order. First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. However, First and Second Chronicles were written toward the end of the this period before the silent years, which is interesting. Um, that's why sometimes you'll see when a writing says, and this happened here, and it's still like this to this day. What he's doing is he's writing in reflection. And so anyways, so the following are the empires that were ruling the then known world up to the time of Jesus' birth. And I've got a little note there, this stuff I'm pulled out of the History Bible at WordPress. So the first one we'll touch on is the Persian Empire. And as you know, the Persian Empire is the last empire that we see in the Old Testament. This is the em empire where um, the Persian kings were sympathetic toward the Jews. Cyrus, Darius, Artaxerxes allowed Jewish captives to return to Palestine where they rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem and restored their own form of worship. Now I'm going to stop here for a minute. I want you to think about this for just a moment. When Israel had kings, again, I re really want to bring you up on this. When Israel had kings, there was King Saul, King David, King Solomon. Things were going pretty good for King Solomon up until a period of time where he just lost all sense of the oneness of God. And, I mean, he had a thousand women, 700 wives, 300 concubines. I don't get it either. But they were leading his heart astray as he got older, and he started to worship and build shrines and build temples for these non-gods. And so all of a sudden, God brought judgment to Solomon, and he said, here's what's going to happen. In your, not your day, but in your son's day, I'm going to split Israel. And so he did. So his son reigns, and he splits Israel. You have the northern kingdom, which is ten tribes, and then you have the southern kingdom, which is two, two and a half tribes, nine and a half tribes, two and a half tribes, which is the tribe of Judah, or the tribe where um, Jerusalem, Judah is. And so now you have these two kings over one country that have, has been divided. So here's the interesting thing is as time progresses, the majority of the time that you read about the kings who lead in Israel, northern Israel, it says, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. Matter of fact, you don't see too many kings that are doing good. He's doing evil in the sight of the Lord. And so a period of time goes by, and all of a sudden the Assyrians come in. God allows the Assyrians come in, and they totally devastate Israel. As a matter of fact, Samaria, which was the place of kings in Israel, was emptied out completely. They were drawn to Assyria, and Assyria sent all kinds of people to live in uh, Samaria. But meanwhile, Judah was still going. The southern part of Israel was still together. So they went for a little while. Not too long after that, but they went for a little while. And all of a sudden, the Babylonians were leaders, world dominance, if you will, uh, was in Babylon. And so Babylon comes in, and they take over Israel. And I know I'm, I'm like whipping through this, and I know I'm going more than 400 years, but I really want us to get together on this. So Babylon becomes in place of power. King Nebuchadnezzar is the first king that we realize in the Old Testament of who's in power when finally the rest of Israel is taken captive into Babylon. Uh, the only ones that are left in Jerusalem and in Israel are the poor. And the week Jeremiah, one of the prophets, was left as well, but he didn't stay long either. He was captured by his own people and taken to Egypt. And so, anyways, so you have uh, Babylon uh, that is reigning and ruling for a period of time three kings worth, if you will, and then when it gets down to the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, he loses the kingdom. The Persians come in. So you have the Persian Empire. And so you had Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes who allowed Jewish captives to return to Palestine, return to Israel, where they rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem and restored their own form of worship. Now, think about this for just a moment. We as a country are called or considered sovereign. For those of you that don't know what sovereign means or sovereignty means, that means that we have the privilege, the right, the freedom to dictate our own dictates, so to speak. 
We have our own laws which govern. We have our own uh, voting for uh, elections, ex things like that. We establish what we want. We do what we want pretty much, unless we're going to be bad people and just go all over the world and create wars, and everybody's going to hate us. But anyway, we're sovereign. We rule our own. We take care of our own. Israel stopped being sovereign, believe it or not, the day that they split. Because they were no longer uni unified, they were split. They had civil war. From then they went into captivity. And for hundreds and hundreds of years, even though they went back home, they were not sovereign. They were still under some form of leadership, some form of tyranny, some form of monarch, some form of government that was not their own. They were not free people. But anyway, they had people who were um, sensitive to them. So in this time frame, they go back and they rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And then we have the Greek Empire. Now the Greek Empire, the then Alexander the Great of Macedonia claimed the land three centuries before Christ, 300 years before Jesus. Alexander the Great left Macedonia to conquer the world and to spread Greek culture and customs to the ends of the earth. Let me stop here for a minute. Well, let me go to the next one. Greek influence continued for several centuries after the conquest. The, Greek, uh, the city of Alexandria in northern Egypt became a center of Greek and Egyptian culture. The second current in the stream of history was Greek culture. Let me stop here for a minute. So those of you that know your Bible a little bit, you know that the original language of the Bible is Hebrew, Aramaic for the Old Testament, New Testament's Greek. Maybe you can see why now. Greek dominant... So much for that. Greek domination, they had to learn the language. Could you imagine if we were dominated by another country, let's say China? Guess what we would have to learn? Guess what would become the language of the day? Remember, if we're dominated, we're no longer free like Israel. They had to learn the language. So think about this for a minute. In their freedom, they knew Hebrew. They read Hebrew. They spoke Hebrew. When they became captive, they had to learn Aramaic. And they wrote part of the Old Testament in Aramaic. wasn't their language by natural birth. It was a language because of conquest. And if that wasn't all, they also had to then learn Greek. Not because it was the language of their, their native tongue. It was the language of their conquest. Everybody with me? So that's why the New Testament is written in Greek, in its original language. Alexandra's armies were followed by athletes, artists, and philosophers who came spreading Greek customs and language. In countries bordering Palestine, even Greek religion was accepted, and the many gods of Greece were worshipped with other pagan gods. The Greeks gloried in their intellect and physical strength, but were pagan in religion. Gymnasiums were built, and Greek sports became popular throughout the empire. After Alexander's death, Palestine was ruled by his successors. The Ptolemy of Egypt, from Alexandria, they ruled Egypt and Palestine. Thousands of Jews were brought as captives to Alexandria, among them scribes who were given the task of translating the law and other Hebrew writings into Greek. After Alexander's death, the Jews experienced some of the most severe persecutions they had ever known for Antiochus, the ruler of Syria tried to obliterate completely the long-established customs and traditions of the Jewish faith. There is no nation, no people group on the planet today that has had so much aggression to obliterate them as the Jews. Not one. I don't care who you are. I don't care what your background is, unless you're Jewish. There is no nation on the planet. There is no people group on the planet that has been such an aggression to obliterate as the Jews. Keep this in mind as we start rolling closer to getting into some of the New Testament. Keep this in mind. Think about, let me, let me just stop here for a minute actually. Try to, as best you can, adopt a mindset of how would that make you change the way you think about life if your race, your people, were the most aggressively pursued to obliterate against, what would that do to the way you think of things? What would that do to the way you approach things? 
How would you respond? What would you be looking for? What questions would you be asking? If you were a type of people like the Jews, especially as we come into the New Testament, Christ's birth, what kind of things, what type of things would you be thinking about if you were a Jew? How would you respond if you were a Jew with absolute annihilation in people's minds and you're no longer free? It's hard as an American. As a matter of fact, let me just say this. It's almost impossible because we don't know. We're getting a brief taste of what it means to be uncomfortable in our freedom because of COVID. But we don't have a clue as to what Israel experienced and their mindset when Jesus came. But today we're going to. Hallelujah. Antiochus' efforts sparked the Maccabean Wars. How many of you have ever heard of the Maccabeans? All right, we're going to talk a little bit about them. So the Jewish Maccabean rule was brief, but they were still under overlords. They still weren't free. So Syrian oppression led to the revolt of the Jews under the Maccabees, and the Jewish people were free until the time of the Roman conquest. And when I say free, I don't mean free like the United States. I mean free, meaning people are leaving them alone, but they were still oppressed. They were still under somebody else's rule. So let's continue. The wealthy and influential Sadducees were priests. In Maccabean times, members of this sect had taken over the government of the country, and later they kept on good terms with their overlords. They emphasized the importance of the book of Moses. This is important to understand New Testament writing. Because you remember the conversations Jesus had with the religious leaders? They were all about Moses. Come on now. Think about this. And think about the philosophy of life back then. They kept on good terms with their overlords. And those good terms, if I could say it this way, those good terms were like my grandson. See, my grandson is a neat kid. I watch him all the time. Well, I don't watch him all the time, but when I watch him, I watch him. I love watching the kid. He's like a TV show. And there's something interesting that I found out about my little grandson. And it's the same thing that my kids, all four of them had, because I used to watch my kids too. You know, when we were raising our kids, we didn't have television because I watched my kids. I played with my kids. I thought it was the greatest thing in the world to watch my kids and see how they think, how they process, and how rebellious they could be. Sorry. Anyway, um, <laughs> here's the thing that I found really interesting about my little grandson at just a little over two years old. Do you know that he has a hard time doing what we do as adults? See, when I tell him he's naughty and he has to sit down, he'll sit down, but then he's like, he doesn't want to sit down. He gets out of the chair. But what do we do? When we don't want to sit down, but we're made to sit down, physically we're sitting down. But boy, the inside's standing up. That's how Israel was with their captors. They wanted freedom so bad it was on the inside but they couldn't express it on the outside because they could be killed. And we have no idea what that's like in America, even with the COVID oppression some of us may consider. We have no idea. But we're getting one. How many of you ever heard of Hanukkah? Hanukkah starts Thursday, you know that? And it's an eight-day celebration, so Thursday to Thursday, the Jewish folks are going to celebrate Hanukkah. So let's talk a little bit about it. And listen, I could have went into this whole long on Hanukkah, but I just wanted to bring us up to Hanukkah, the quick little snippet. Hanukkah is a celebration of the Maccabees. Retaking Jerusalem, they demolished the now-polluted altar of the temple and built a new one. They discarded and defiled ritual objects and replaced them. They even found a small quantity of consecrated oil for use in the sacred lamps. The story goes, and this is very abbreviated, folks. The story goes, the priest lit the oil for the first days of worship. Miraculously, the next day, there was enough for the next day. And so on, until the entire eight days of worship had been observed. So in other words, they only had a little bit of oil, and they were concerned that they wouldn't have oil long enough to keep their lamps lit. 
And, but guess what? God provided spirit, uh, uniquely, miraculously, enough oil every single day for eight days. That's the reason the candelabras have eight, I don't know what you call them, arms. And there's eight candles. Each day they light a candle to memor- commemorate the Maccabees victory and the miraculous that God did. Is that cool? Now we're getting into the Roman Empire. The countries surrounding Palestine were now occupied by Roman legions. Their commanding officer was ordered by Julius Caesar to put an end to civil strife in Jerusalem. He captured the city in 63 B.C. Notice the word captured. They're not free. Later, Herod Antipater, who ruled the neighboring country of Idumea, was made governor of Judah. Roman occupation influenced the political history of Palestine. Governors and rulers were subject to the emperor in Rome, and many Roman troops were stationed in the country to see that law and order were maintained. Rome also imposed heavy taxes. The Roman Empire was held together by a network of roads, trade, good mail service, and well-trained legions. For those of you that don't know what legions are, military, basically, is what it is. Its citizens were free to travel. Herod the Great persuaded the Romans to give him the title King of the Jews, important for biblical understanding. Very important. He got the note from Caesar that he could be called or become King of the Jews. Keep that in mind as you read the New Testament, especially Jesus on the cross. You know, when you think about it sometimes, and I know I'm getting a little ahead, but we used to have a cross over here, and on top of the cross were in the three languages, king of the Jews. So think about this for just a moment. Do you know what that really was saying? It was not giving exaltation to Jesus that he was the king of the Jews. It was a mockery and an aggressive stance to tell the Jews any kind of insurrection, this is what you get. Some of us think, oh, they recognize Jesus. Look, they wrote in three languages, the king of the Jews. No. As a matter of fact, that's why he went to the cross, because of who he was. Come on now. Remember what Pilate said? He knew that they were jealous of Jesus. Are you a king? Pilate says to him, yes, I am. Hmm. Very important, king of the Jews. Herod married a daughter of the high priest. Can you imagine? He married a Jewish girl and began reconstruction of the temple, but was hated by the Jews as a foreigner and usurper. Fearful that he might lose his throne, Herod murdered the high priest and even members of his own family. It is not surprising that when he heard of the birth of Christ, who was to be king of the Jews, he sought to destroy the child. See, it's one thing that's interesting is man can call you anything they want, but when God calls you something, that stays. What's so great about all this information? Gives us a better perspective into New Testament scripture during the time of Jesus. Our first example is when the Magi went to inquire about Jesus. In Matthew chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 6, says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Ooh, ooh, think about the sting Herod must have felt. Now listen, it wasn't just him that felt uncomfortable with this statement. Keep, let's keep going. For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. And all Jerusalem with him. Why would the Jewish people be troubled over non Jews from the East that have declared that the King of the Jews has been born? They saw his star. There's so many miracles and so much stuff that's going on. Why would Israel be upset, disturbed that there was a King of the Jews? Let me tell you why. See, sometimes we desire a Savior, don't we? Come, Lord Jesus, come. And we may have a picture in our mind of what that should look like. See, we're great designers and great planners. The only thing is, is God sometimes doesn't really like our plans and designs. 
Now think about this for just a moment, going back to what we were talking about a little earlier. If the Jews were oppressed, and if they were almost annihilated over and over and over again, and they were not free in their own country to the point where, just before Christ was born, they had the Romans come in and manhandle Jerusalem, Jerusalem. That was the city of kings. That was the city of God. They manhandled the people of Jerusalem to the point where he married this king, this secular king, marries this Jewish girl who was the daughter of a priest. And remember what they said? They might have been desiring a savior on the inside, but on the outside, they wanted to keep peace. Why? Because if they didn't keep peace, the Romans had the power and they had the plan to annihilate them. Put that in your thought process as we read through. See, sometimes when we think about Jesus coming, and I'm going to stay as close as I can to here, you know, just a six-foot thing and whatever, we think of this. How pretty. How nice and neat. Wow. That must have been the time period and the attitude of the people when Jesus came. Oh, it's just so good. I say no. I say no. When King Herod heard this, he was troubled. Know what that word in the Greek means? Troubled, bothered, concerned, irritated. Like you've got to do something about this. And he did. And all Jerusalem with him. So let's continue. Gathering together all the chief priests and scribes, because now he's concerned of the people. He inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. See, he wasn't ignorant of the Messiah, and neither were they. They said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, for out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. What they were doing is they were declaring the word of God to a pagan. What the pagan then did is didn't believe in the word of God necessarily, but he wanted to make sure he squelched rebellion. That's the reason that two years and down, he killed every male child in Bethlehem. Are you getting this? They want salvation on the inside, but on the outside, they just want to keep the peace, keep the peace. If we say different, then why didn't they rise up in rebellion when all those soldiers went into Bethlehem and were killing babies? Picture a baby. Picture my son Liam, uh, grandson Liam. Two years old. Could you imagine? He's minding his own business in the house, and here comes soldiers. And Kenny's a big guy. I would never want to mess with Kenny, and he's my son-in-law. He's a big guy. He'll protect his own. But man, you bring like a legion of, of soldiers into his house, and then they kill him in front of the parents? Why didn't they react? Why didn't they stand up? Why didn't they fight? I'll tell you why. You beat somebody long enough. You might want deliverance, but you want peace more than you want deliverance. How many of you are getting a new perspective on the New Testament? I hope so. Our second example is the response of the chief priests and Pharisees after Jesus rose Lazarus from the dead. That story is an amazing story to me. John 11 starting in verse 45. Therefore many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what he had done believed in him. But some of them, he raised Lazarus from the dead, but some of them went to the Pharisees and told them the things which Jesus has done. It's the religious leaders. People know the word of God, right? Therefore the chief priests and the Pharisees convened a council and were saying, what are we doing? For this man is performing many miracles, many signs. Now listen, listen carefully. If we let him go on like this, all men will believe in him and, listen, the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. I have to believe the Pharisees wanted to deliver just as bad as the common people, just as bad as you or I. I believe it. I believe it. But they didn't see Jesus doing it the right way. They didn't even see him doing, being the right guy. 
in the right family. They didn't see any of that stuff. And so all they thought about was this. Romans, I mean, miracle after miracle. I mean, I don't know. Sometimes we think, how dense can you be? They weren't dense. They were afraid. Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. The Romans will come and take away our place and our nation. This is after Jesus is an adult doing miracles. That same way of thinking was way back into his birth. See, Jesus was kind of unique. His idea of peace, ladies and gentlemen, is completely foreign to secular humanism. Did you ever read his famous Sermon on the Mount beginning? Well, it's in two places, but I, I like the, the, the way it's put together in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. First thing out of Jesus' mouth. First thing out of Jesus' mouth. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You know what that word poor means in the Greek? Bankrupt. Empty. See, because when you're empty, you can be filled. See, Jesus performing all these miracles even got to Herod's ears. He wanted to see him. He thought he was John the Baptist raised from the dead. He wanted Jesus to come and stand in front of him and perform tricks like a magician. See, Jesus was a pain in the side of the people of Israel because they didn't see him coming. They misunderstood his coming. They were afraid of him because he could not be contained like they could. See, that's the thing that's interesting about our God, ladies and gentlemen. He cannot be contained. You and I cannot contain him. Our minds cannot contain him. The Bible says heaven and earth can't contain him. In other words, if you're offended by anything you read in the scriptures, it's not God who has to turn and think about it differently. It's us. Are you getting this? So now see, if I was there at that time and if I was Jewish at that time, I would have been in the same position as they were. Say, well, I don't think I would have been. I think I would have been that guy that would have been, okay, Jesus, let's, let's kick it. Maybe not. Maybe not. Even Peter got offended to the point where you get this little slave girl that says, weren't you with him in the garden? Nope. Three times. Our third example is in Ephesus. See, Rome had a long reach. After the gospel was preached, silversmiths, idol makers, created an uproar due to the possible loss of business. We're going to pick it up in Acts chapter 19. So then if Demetrius and the craftsmen who are with him have a complaint against any man, the courts are in session and proconsuls are available. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you want anything beyond this, it shall be settled in the lawful assembly. Listen why. For indeed we are in danger of being accused of a riot in connection with today's events. Why would they be concerned? They're in Ephesus. Rome would squelch all activities that were considered riotous, just like this. They would kill and arrest and ask questions later. For indeed we're in danger of being accused of a riot in connection with today's event, since there was no real cause for it, and in, the connect and in this connection we will be unable to account for this disorderly gathering. After saying this, he dismissed the assembly. Israel was not a sovereign nation and hadn't been for many years. Roman oppression was great. The tension among those who were living there at that time was great. The last thing people wanted to do was to create issues. You know, it reminds me of um, what's happened with Antifa and the Black Lives Matter movement. And yeah, I'm saying it right from the pulpit, and I don't care. 
People were afraid. And you would be too if you've got a group of thugs coming down your street. And it doesn't matter what they're promoting. You just know that there's a possibility that you could be killed. And even more than that, in some places, they had preferred treatment over the innocent. Doesn't that sound a little like Rome? With Jewish oppression? A little bit? And I don't care that I'm online. Truth is truth. The last thing people wanted to do was to create issues. They were just trying to get along in their land ruled by pagans. Fear was hovering over the Jews. Difficulty was everywhere. There was oppression was severe as the taxes were so difficult. Not only were they giving their hard-earned money to the Roman government, if that wasn't enough, some of their own were working for the Romans and as tax collectors getting rich by stealing extra taxes from the common person. With corruption in the government, corruption in the synagogue, major difficulty surrounding the people, there seemed to be no answer in sight. What might have been something the Jewish people were waiting for, praying for, hoping for? What about you? What about you in the electronic world? You know, I got to tell you, I don't understand God sometimes and how he does things. And neither do you. And I'll tell you why. Because in my mind, in, in the way that I would make God do things, which obviously is way off and wrong, we would have utopia. The Christians would be elevated to places of prominence. And why not? Because we're Christians. We would be left alone. We would never be mocked. As a matter of fact, if anybody mocked a Christian, spanking for you, buddy. Are you thinking about this now? But if there's one thing that I get from this Christmas story of when Jesus hit the scene, it's this. Ready or not, here he comes. In a manner and in a way where everybody was taken by surprise. Even to the point the guy is doing miracles, tons and tons and tons of miracles. Demons would see him. And you know what they do? I know who you are. You're Jesus, the Son of God, or whatever they'd say. They'd say things like that. You know what he'd tell them? Shut up and come out. Wham, they're gone. I don't know about you, but if I was a Pharisee or a Sadducee, I'd be like, oh, i got to hang out with this guy. But they didn't. Because their situation, the way they thought, the way they felt, the way he did things, didn't make sense to their doctrine and theology. So I'm asking you this morning, are you willing, to the best of our ability, are you willing to ride this ride that we have and possibly have coming and trust God even when we don't get it? How about you by electronic? I'm just about finished. I'm asking you at home, are you willing, are you willing to trust God First and foremost, if you do not know him, you've not made a profession of faith, you've not invited Jesus to forgive you of all your sin and cleanse you from your unrighteousness. If you haven't done that, I'd encourage you to do that now. You say, what sin? Anytime you've broken any of his laws, look it up in Exodus chapter 20. Any of those laws that you have broken, anytime you are a criminal in his sight. I was a criminal in his sight. And he has something in eternity called jail. We call it jail, but it's hell. And it's eternal fire. And listen, he doesn't want you going there. I don't want you going there. But I'm asking you right now, would you trust your soul to him? Would you trust your salvation to him? I'm asking you to do that now. Please. Please. And if you're making a confession for the first time, you're inviting Christ to be your Lord and Savior the first time, write us. Let us know. I would love to hear from you. I would love to send you something. If you don't have a Bible, let me know. I will send you a Bible. You who are a Christian, listen, I don't know what's coming. All I know is that at the end of the book in Revelations, I don't care how peaceful things people say it's going to be, that's not what Jesus said. It's going to get messy. Are you willing to trust him in whatever mess we're going to walk through? Because you know what screams Jesus in somebody's life the most 
but that in difficulty they see him in us and through us. Are you willing to ride this out with me? I hope so. God bless you. Thanks for tuning in with us this morning.